My name is Amy Larson. I am the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Simplifya, which is an operational and regulatory compliance uh, software platform, and we are based out of Denver. And let me tell you how happy I am to be in San Francisco today because it is currently 21 degrees, and they are predicting four inches of snow at my house today. So I am very happy to be here, let me tell you. Um, prior to, uh, just a little bit background about me, prior to joining Simplifya, I actually worked uh, with an integrated marketing agency in Denver, and I launched their cannabis division about three years ago. Um, I'm heavily, have been involved with the industry for for probably four or five years now. Um, I serve as the vice chair of the marketing committee for the National Cannabis Industry Association. And so I'm really excited to speak with um, these great people up here, super smart people on the panel today, about kind of the intersection of what we're seeing in the industry from um, a consumer marketing perspective with the limitations that you know dispensaries and the industry as a whole have placed on them by Google and Facebook and those things, and how um, licensed operators and um, businesses can really put together the best tech stack um, to, to reach those customers and to build loyalty and to really drive their brand awareness. So with that, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves real quick um, because they will probably do a much better job than I will. Cool. My name is Ken. I'm Ken Ramirez. I'm CEO and co-founder of Vault36. Uh, we're a blockchain-based digital payment system very similar to Venmo. Um, we allow consumers to uh, seamlessly purchase cannabis at the point of sale, e-commerce, and so forth without having to rely on cash. Um, hi, I'm Ashley Elsner. I am the CEO of Artery Pay, and actually it's a fairly similar platform um, to what Alt36 <coughs> has in place. Um, but I am a recovering lawyer, and so we have also <laughs> added in um, the anti-money laundering compliance that financial institutions are required to do um, right into the payment system. So we have relationships with both the both uh, banking as well as um, are able to act as a banking alternative in order to uh, custody those assets for you. Um, but it's a very Venmo-like experience. It integrates into point of sale. Um, very easy to use for your consumers and also very easy to use for you. Uh, my name is Guillermo Bravo. I'm the CEO and founder of Foot Traffic. Uh, we're a marketing agency for dispensaries and delivery services. So we you know, help manage the technology and marketing channels for dispensaries to drive foot traffic to their stores and visitors to their website with the end goal of you know, persuading customers to, to make a purchase and join their loyalty program and you know, be a loyal customer. And I guess before we start real quick, I'd love to know um, a little bit the makeup of the audience so we can make sure that we're targeting um, a little bit of our conversation to, to what's going to be most beneficial for you guys. How many, uh, is anybody in here a licensed operator, owns a dispensary, owns a, okay. And is everybody else working on the ancillary services consulting side of some, okay, okay. So that kind of helps us target um, the conversation, but I think whether you're consulting a licensed operator or you are a licensed operator, there's really um, a lot of confusion around what all of the parts and pieces that you need to have in place before you open business or before you tell your clients what they need to do to open their business. Um, what, I guess, Guillermo, let's start with you real quick. From a tech stack perspective, what are the things that people need to have in place and how how do we make sure that we're, they're getting the right ones? Okay, yeah, so I'll uh, kind of start from the top. So as a licensed retailer, you'll need a point of sale system. So POS, um, you know, there's a lot of great companies out there. It just depends um, kind of what you're looking for as a dispensary. So if you are, uh, first, first of all, if you're vertically integrated or not, that's one thing to consider. Uh, single store, multi-store, it's another thing to consider. Um, Let's see, depending on, your, I guess, your, the, the workflow that you, you, you want to leverage uh, while in the store, that's another factor. Um, POS is probably the most saturated part of the industry as far as technology. There's, I don't know, 30 plus. Uh, so it really just depends on your needs. And, and more entering. Yeah, and which state you're in. I know like Trees is really popular in the Bay Area in California. Green Bits, uh, same thing. They have real you know, high saturation in Washington, Oregon, California as well. You, know, you have the Biotrack, MJ Freeway, which are kind of the older companies that uh, 
I would say their dashboards aren't as nice and uh, user friendly as some of the newer companies. Um, but you know, just depending on what you're looking to achieve as a dispensary or a delivery service, um, you know, delivery services, there's different point of sale systems. Um, so you know, there's Blaze that you can use for that. I know Trees offers that as well. Um, so just depending on what you're looking for in a POS system. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of items to weed out. Kova is another. Um, gosh, there's there's an endless amount. Meadow, I heard. Yeah. So yeah. So as far as the POS, um, there's a lot of choices. So you know, my recommendation would be to at least demo three, and see which one's going to work best. You know, for your for your goals. Uh, so that's the first part. Uh, the second part would be you know deciding on an online menu. So you know. Online menus are crucial for uh, in-store purchases and for online purchases for pre-order. So, you know, there's different um, online menus. So there's uh, kind of native that you that you can uh, you know pay a company and they can build you a menu. So Ola is one of those, which is previously uh, used to be called a Find. Um, there's Marketplace online menus. So that's Leafly, Weed Maps, Jane, Dutchy. And so on. Uh, so a lot of those, um, you know, they build out all the product imagery, descriptions, and everything for you on the marketplace. But if you want to build your own menu, let's say trees, trees and Ola are very similar. You have to actually build out the whole menu yourself. So you have to build out the descriptions, the images, um, the effects, all that information yourself. So depending on how you want to to move going forward, it's. Um, you know, both of them work. I, I've seen clients use different technology stacks and they work. It just depends on the operator. So you really have to uh, promote the menu on your website. You have to promote it in store, the bud tenders. You can have kiosks in store as well. So that's a crucial part. Uh, and then the last I would say is a CRM. So a CRM is, is crucial for your business. Um, you know, data is king now. I mean, it passed uh, oil. You know, as uh, one of the <laughs> just uh, highly valuable. So, you know, the the cost per acquisition and getting someone into the store one time, you really want to capture their data. And there's different ways that you can do that. And the CRM is one. Uh, and you know, the POS, the online menu, and the CRM all work uh, together seamlessly. So, uh, so if you when you want them to, yeah. So if you have the right technology stack in place. Uh, you can capture a customer's you know, first name, last name, email, phone number, and the most important part is their purchasing habits. So similar to you know, Amazon, we want to build that history of what they've purchased and what they're interested in. So this can all be accomplished through all these different data points, which is the POS system, the online menu, and the CRM. Great. And then once you've got that kind of base tech stack to, to do your retail sales, obviously a big component of success, kind of regardless of where you are in the industry, is being able to get paid. And we know that getting paid is very complicated in this industry unless you want to carry around big suitcases of, of cash, which nobody really does. So, so how, um, Ashley and Ken, how, how when someone is looking to, to decide which payment provider they want to work with or which type of solution they want to work with. A, how do we know it's legal and compliant? And B, how do you distinguish the differences so you can make a, the best decision for your business? Yeah, absolutely. So when, uh, I would say the first thing to take a look at is whether or not uh, the payment solution allows you your customers to pay with debit or credit card. Um, that's pretty much a uh, red flag immediately. Uh, most debit or credit card solutions, actually every single debit credit card solution in the industry as it stands, are violating Visa MasterCard internal rules. Um, they are actively looking for uh, operators, acquiring banks, and so forth that are absconding, miscoding transactions. So a lot of times you'll see that uh, on the statement you're a florist or I just bought jewelry. Um, so there's actually been federal precedent that's been set in online gambling. So basically you're putting a lot at risk by even looking at those solutions. Well, I mean, that's that's not even a close call. I mean, when you start talking about miscoding transactions or even things that are meant to be as a pass-through to get you to credit card um, systems, I mean, there's the online gambling as a precedent, but frankly, this is this has been set rules forever. You can't miscode transactions. When you do that, um, it also means that you're not telling the government 
the accurate information on, so there, there's two things that are going on there. You've got financial fraud, you've got money laundering. I mean, that's what miscoding transactions actually is, is money laundering. Um, and we'll, we'll get off that because obviously it's not deliberate, but one of the things with respect to debit and credit that you have to understand is they're reselling somebody else's product. So if somebody is reselling somebody else's product, that means that they do not get to set the rules over who uses it. And so that's what you want to look, you want to watch out for that thing. Um, the other thing that I think that is very important is vet the backgrounds of the people who are providing these financial solutions. You will know from their background whether they actually have the operational knowledge to be able to, to help you with this. And um, you're, you're looking for people with, with backgrounds like ours, like financial institution law is my background, operations, financial institution operations, um, or pe people depth on the team in those particular areas on compliance on, and this is financial compliance, not cannabis compliance, um, on, on legal, on the, you want people with deep backgrounds on that because they're going to know what the rules of the road are and then you're not going to have to worry about the sustainability of the solution or the liability also transferring onto you because that does happen. I mean, just because you have a, a, um, a, pro a provider, a processor who is doing something for you, um, they, <laughs> the liability goes along the entire chain, which is part of the reason why Visa and MasterCard are so wary of it um, and keep shutting down processors. So if you want a solution that your customers are going to be able to use and interface with on a regular basis, you want something that's going to be sustainable. And so that legality, like you're hitting to, that, that's a huge red flag. Um, one other thing that I'm going to add, and I'm sure you'll hop into this, is you want something that's very user-friendly and that plays well with the rest of your tech stack. So you don't need a system that has like, ri like ridiculous equipment for you to bring in, is difficult to integrate with your point of sale systems or things like that. You want something simple, something easy to use. Um, and you also should be looking for something that doesn't have volatility. Um, this is another one of these little little things that are in there that in a lot of systems are like, oh, well, we're converting to a crypto and then converting out. If they don't do it fast enough or well enough, um, I think you guys do a pretty good job with that, um, keeping the volatility pretty well. Um, we use a closed loop system that does not have any volatility whatsoever. We're really just using blockchain on the back end to build our financial institution on. So it's the backbone of the institution. It's the anti-money laundering compliance built in. Um, it's the recording, the settlement of the transaction. It's, it's um, the reporting of it. And I think you guys have a, a slightly different solution, but it's a good one too. Yeah, so let me just clarify. We mm -hmm. don't use cryptocurrency whatsoever in our solution. Um, yeah. so we, we don't use, either. So the, on the back end, we use the Dash blockchain as our ledger, a way of recording the transaction. So Same. when we're working with financial institutions and state regulatory bodies, they have a clear view in all the transactions as it relates, and they can be assured that each transaction is immutable with a timestamp and that it's never been altered in any way. Yeah, that's one of the beautiful things about blockchain is you cannot alter those records. So there's there's nothing that can be hidden, and regulators are starting to see that, and they're starting to understand that, and that's a solution that is great for transparency in the industry and great for data. So I know, Guillermo, you um, hit on a little bit the importance and, and value of, of customer data and making sure that we can gather that. as. We are, you know, as the industry grows, it's also, you know, going to be shrinking in a different way, meaning, you know, the big MSOs, the big companies are going to be coming in and, you know, eventually consolidating a lot of the industry as we see that. So maintaining that customer data and maintaining your customer loyalty is a huge part of the industry. How does that relationship or that customer experience um, manifest, but how, how do payment processing or payment opportunity um, benefit or impact that that consumer experience? Hmm, that that was a tough question. Let's see. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know about the payment side. I don't know if you want to jump in on that. But as far as data, um, you know, leveraging that relationship with customers, uh, and you know, the first part is capturing that data and having information about them and you know their their preferences their interests what they purchase um gender age demo like all these different demographics can be pulled in uh there's a lot of data points uh so i can start with so point of sale is probably the you know you're talking with the customer directly and that's the that's the entry point for a lot of the data so that's going to be the phone number uh, that's going to be their name. Um, you know, that's 
that's kind of similar to a loyalty program. If you go to CVS or, or Rite Aid, Safeway, they all ask for you know phone numbers so you can you know get points and you can join the loyalty program and so on. Um, so that's one main entry point. Uh, another would be the online menu, which I mentioned before. Uh, so that's going to be this, all the same data points: you know, name, email, phone number, uh, purchasing habits, and then you know, depending on which CRM you use. Uh, so you know, we use Spring Big on a lot of our accounts, Sprout, uh, Data Owl. Uh, you can actually pull the information from your point of sale system. You know what they've purchased. Uh, I've purchased Absolute Extract. Uh, uh, vape, vape concentrates, and you know, I don't know. Let's see. I uh, purchased some topicals, so I can go in into my CRM, and I can segment out all the customers, and I can send all these targeted campaigns to anyone who's purchased Absolute Extracts vape, you know, vape pens in the last 90 days, and send them information in regards to a vendor day, or a, a new product launch, or a uh, you know, a deal that's you know, a, a sale, a, a flash sale, whatever it might be. So um, there's a lot of different opportunities to, to reach customers. And, you know, in this space, I and mean, the, reali the reality of it is most people are price shoppers. So they're going to look at uh, five stores and five menus in San Francisco and see what products they have. If they're looking for pre-rolls, they're going to look at... Uh, you know, they're going to look at the different price points. And I know that a lot of these dispensaries have daily deals. So it could be, you know, pre-roll Tuesdays or whatever it might be. So they'll plan their trip around that so they can get, you know, 10%, 20% discounts. Um, so that's, um, that's one thing to consider. There's, there's so many options and there's so much saturation with the dispensaries. You can, in San Francisco, you can walk uh, two miles and I don't know how many dispensaries there'll be within that radius. And then just depending on if you want to, to pick up or you want it delivered or if you actually want to consume on site, that's going to be the factors that are used to determine that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was going to say, as far as uh, the loyalty in the SMS tax, probably one of the best uh, means to actually getting putting the right deals at the right time in front of the right customer. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, we, we partner with companies right now. Uh, we're getting ready to roll out a new, uh, a new product that... Uh, essentially takes the consumer data and then it'll put it through a machine learning process and use artificial intelligence to identify whether or not somebody likes a buy one get one free or a percentage off of whether somebody likes indica versus sativa whether like concentrate versus flower um, so and i work with many dispensaries that don't have loyalty programs or don't have the smx text um, I, I can tell you definitively that they aren't driving near the business that those that do have those uh, systems in place do um, and then the, from a payments perspective, the one thing that we're actually going to be doing with these, let's call them very specific targeted promos, is once we text the customer that, they'll be able to purchase those promos right out of, the, right out of their text. So next time they go into the dispensary, so you're capturing on the revenue then, and then they'll be able to redeem that, that promo next time they go into the dispensary. So it's really starting to target and then putting a time limit on it. So that way, you know, you're, you're applying the pressure so that way they're like, oh, this is time sensitive. I, this is a great deal. I have to do it. Or as a way to get start upselling your customers. So maybe traditionally they they like King Louis the Thirteenth flower. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you want to basically go send them a promo code and say, since you like King Louis the Thirteenth flower, we want to give you fifty percent off a uh, King Louis the Thirteenth concentrate. And so that way you're able to actually get them to start increasing in let's call it uh, different tiers as far as pricing. And then I guess just to add on that, I mean uh, you already touched on the importance of SMS marketing. I mean it's really gold like it's to get to get someone's phone number that's uh it's so much money long term so for every cent that you spend on the text message that's typically what it costs to send one out you'll get between two and eight dollars roi on that so it's undeniable it's a really good conversion yeah. rate it's very very high and then especially like um i really want to emphasize like a lot of these dispensaries use text messaging but they use it in the wrong way so I like to call it the spray and pray approach. So they just like send it to everyone, like here's 20% off, uh, let's say 20% off flour. And if I don't like flour, I don't care and I'm gonna, I'm gonna unsubscribe. So depending on which CRM you use, um, I know in let's say Spring Big, I can go in, like I mentioned before, I can go in and target people based on uh, product 
brand, product category, how many times they visited, how many times they, uh, how much money they spent total, how much average they spent. There's all these different factors that you can use to create these targeted campaigns. And on those campaigns, from my, from my just uh, let's just say from the last 30 days, I have a client, and we're doing um, probably about 40% conversion rate on those segmented SMS campaigns. So they're smaller audiences, but they convert at high level. So you know, if you send it to 500 people, and you know, 200 of those people come in and make a purchase, that's a that's a good day. So. And I want to just kind of underscore something that we had talked about together um, before this panel, and that's really, obviously, the, the bread and butter, the, the gold for, for dispensaries and retail locations is that customer loyalty and being able to drive those consumers back into your store and capture that. Um, the impact of, um, I think, what the, you know, as, as the consumer evolves, consumers are going to demand more convenience. We're going to demand more opportunity. I may pay a little more at this dispensary down the road, but this one will take my my Visa card, and I don't have to go to the ATM. I think that was an, it was a really no, but it was a really interesting conversation that we had. That I think would be, um, I think there were some some great um, it, it's pieces true. that came out of that that would be interesting for these. Yeah, that's very true. Um, um, convenience is a very big, important part of working with your customers. Um, and so places where you can pay digitally are, are going to win. Um, dispensaries are going to, are going to be able to drive more traffic based on which places are going to take stuff that, that are very easy for them to use. Because honestly, cash is a pain. Cash is a huge pain. And going to the ATMs, there's a, a high cost to a consumer on that. You've got um, up to 250 on the entry point, um, sometimes even higher than that. Um, you've got 250 charged by their bank on the back end. So you're costing your consumer something when you're, when you're doing that. And that's money that they could be spending on your products instead. Um, so one of the beautiful things about having digital money, um, a digital payment source, is that that also gives you the opportunity to upsell because there's no cap on how much they can spend. Whereas with cash and with the very, very high tax rates, that ends up being a huge limitation and causes people to have to spend less in your dispensary. So you're actually able to, to better benefit um, from the CRMs, from, from, um, from the use of things like mobile wallets. Um, and it, you know, naughty, naughty, but yeah, where credit cards are taken, people, are, people do pay attention to that. I think one of the major it's sorry, convenience, right? one of the major things that you should also take a look at is the demographics, where you're located, who yeah. are your clientele. So there's a lot of clients, customers that aren't interested in paying any other way than cash. They love they they That's love true. the privacy of it, um, and so <clears throat> figuring out how to create a program to build trust with your customers and understand which ones that that are comfortable with paying cash and don't want uh, you know any information exposed to their financial institution. Um, and that kind of feeds in again to like kind of the second piece. Anything that you're taking a look at, you know, from a customer perspective, you know, when it's going and it's clearing on their bank account, does it say, you know, True Med Dispensary, Relief Dispensary, or, you know, does it say, say Artery Pay or all, yeah, 36. all 36, 36 financial? So yeah. uh, whatever it shows up as, creating something that's discreet that the customers mm -hmm. feel comfortable using, um, and then being able to really, really kind of understand your demographics so that way you're providing the right solutions for your customers. And, and yeah. security on that one, because we're, we're mm -hmm. talking about digital products as well, and, and security uh, security of your, your customer information is something that you should be thinking about. And I'm not, I'm not sure that that gets thought about as much as it should be in this industry, but as things move to more digital <coughs> platforms, you have to be concerned with your, your consumer's security on their data as mm -hmm. well. So you want, we, we're, both of us have very good cybersecurity on our, our systems. It's very protective. And then just adding to that, you know, by you know, having that convenience available where you don't have to pay in cash in store, the average ticket just from my from, from my clients is you know upwards of ten percent higher that people spend. Uh, so if you offer that solution, that convenience, they're gonna spend more money. And then another way that you can increase uh, your average ticket is to offer the online menu. Mm -hmm. So when people have the convenience to you know, browse around for 45 minutes, they're in bed, they're looking at different products, and they can really you know, read all the descriptions, read, look at all the pictures, look at all the you know, THC to CBD ratios. Um, they'll make a bigger purchase as opposed to in store, you have a bud tender, sometimes they're rushing them, you only have five, 10 minutes to talk with a bud tender. 
Um, you know, those are two ways that you can, you know, two things that you can implement that'll increase, uh, you know, your, affect your bottom line. Absolutely. And the other thing is uh, you've got to really understand the culture of the dispensary or operator that you're working with. Um, traditionally, uh, they have not been exposed to, let's call it, all this different technology. A lot of them feel threatened by it. A lot of them don't trust it. A lot of them feel, you know, I'm making money the way that I'm doing it. Why would I take a chance and implement something to where I could possibly lose money? So, you know, some, some operators, you'll go to them and say, listen, you know, the payment's going to be 3%. And then you're looking at the loyalty, and that's another 3%, usually on average, that you the loyalty programs get back to their customers. So now they're saying, listen, now I'm 6% in when you know excise tax is 25% on top of sales tax. So now I'm basically cutting into all of my profit margins. But what, they, what you really have to do is help them understand that by implementing these technologies, that 6% that you're going to be paying in, let's call it fees for payment and fees for the loyalty, will be completely uh, outweighed with the consumer increase in transaction and actually the increase in number of customers that are coming through your door. And at the same time, if you think about it, right, uh, let's call it, say, traditional cash payments. Yep. Let's call it the average customer visits about 10 minutes. You go in and there's about seven minutes of perusing, picking out your product, and then you get out of line and you have to go to the ATM to take out cash. That takes, and depending whether someone's at the ATM or not, that takes about three minutes. So essentially by cutting out that ATM experience, you're essentially able to increase your customer foot traffic by an additional 30%. And that's something that's really huge because, I mean, I've gone into pretty much every dispensary in downtown San Francisco uh, over the past five days. <laughs> Didn't say I made purchases. Some of them I did. Uh, but I've walked out of a lot of them. I got into line, and I'm just looking at the line. I'm like, I, I'm impatient. I can't do this. I'm out. And I, I mean, it's, it's something that a lot of the dispensaries around here are really struggling with. And especially if, you know, you have great product to back that, then it's just... I mean, you kind of take a look at like the queue, and at a certain point, customers are walking out your door. And then you're watching money just walk out your door at that point. So really creating a comprehensive program uh, around, you know, let's call it digital technology and then customer loyalty is it's really crucial. Yeah, and then just to add on that, if, you, if you're having these problems, like a lot of the California stores, I don't know, uh, you know, they've been around for some time and they... You know, the the transition to recreational there's you know a lot more foot traffic coming in the stores just organically um so one thing i would recommend is having a you know online order for pickup like express lane yeah. that's crucial i know uh, i have some i have a client in seattle that does 40 percent of all their business from pre-order pickups because it's a high it's a high high like you know a downtown seattle uh, I could say have a heart bell town like that one gets a ton of traffic and you know same thing you know let's say purple star MD here I know they get a lot of traffic because they're right off the bar station so having that uh, online pickup available so when people come in they have their product ready they can get in they can get out if they paid already even better uh, that'll just cut down the amount of time that they have in the dispensary yeah and uh, to add on to that um Places, it, places that states that allow delivery. That's that's another huge driver of business. Is yeah. again, there's the online shopping, there's delivery, there's in-store pickup. Um, but being able to allow people the time to look through your catalog of materials, of of things that that you're selling, and make those purchases at that point, then they go and pick up the product, or then it gets delivered to them. That's additional, that's more stuff that's getting done quickly. Like it's the, it's the 30% more in time. It's, it's the co consumers that don't even have to come into your store. So you're getting a lot of really good, um, really good like digital foot traffic. Yeah. So, and yeah. then with delivery, the one thing to think about as well, <clears throat> as far as the payment is related, so a lot of dispensaries will opt out of delivery just because they don't want to be sending their drivers with cash and product, especially uh, very in a lot of it, like in Arizona specifically, there are very limited number of dispensaries that will actually offer delivery services because of that reason. So you got to kind of- consumers like it for the privacy reasons mm -hmm. again, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no. Well, and we're lazy. So, we get yeah. Taco Bell delivered. Well, I mean, so- Oh, and if you, th if you <laughs> think about it, if you're getting it's delivery- Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, if you're getting delivery, right, you're sitting on your couch, Probably have already uh, you're probably already engaged in some products. Um, and what's the last thing you really want to do? You put in your order for delivery. You want to get off your couch to go to an ATM to get cash. That defeats yeah. the entire let's call it consumer experience. Yes. So for me, I if I'm going to be ordering delivery, I don't want to get off my couch. In right. fact, it's probably best that I am on my couch when I'm doing it. So everybody else on the road wants you on your couch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, you'll, exactly. and you'll probably order some food delivery with that too, yeah, right? right? So. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. Fact, in fact, let's let's partner up. Let's partner up the food and the. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ken, you kind of alluded to this a little bit um, a few minutes ago with. Um, dispensary owners and, and retail owners really being, you know, they've done things a certain way for a long time and being, you know, nobody wants to, to bring something new on, a new software on. And, and, you know, on the other side of that, there are so many new products. Every time you turn around, there's new products, there's new tech, there's a new, you know, bright, shiny object out there. How do you, as products, as marketing companies, how do you increase the adoption of your product how have you been successful? How have you, you know, broken through that that buzz barrier? Absolutely. So <clears throat> there's a couple ways that we work with uh, the dispensary. So number one, uh, we work with the bud tenders. We want them to be ambassadors of our of our platform. So essentially, when the payment time comes, they're sending them to the ATM. So every single time somebody registers, or the bud tender will uh, get someone to register and make their payment, we'll actually reward the bud tender with five bucks. So that way, you know, three customers are registering in an hour instead of sending them to the ATM. Now they've doubled their hourly wage. For a lot of bud tenders, that's huge, especially in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, second is uh, we work with the customers. So uh, we work with the dispensary to work with the customers. So we'll actually incentivize the customers. So we'll do, you know, register with all 36, get a penny pre-roll on your next purchase. And so that way, you're actually giving the customer value to be able to change their behaviors because customers traditionally aren't going to change their behaviors unless there's value or a benefit in doing it. Um, and then at the same time, you know, you have to make the customers aware, not just reward them, but make them aware. So we work with the dispensaries to do targeted marketing campaigns. The text campaigns are great because I can send out my, dis the dispensary can send out a text to say, Hey, you know, true med dispensary is now accepting all 36. Click on the link here to get a p penny pre-roll on your next visit, um, to register, get, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, but basically you have to, you have to, you have to spend money on consumer adoption. And that's just one thing that, you know, a lot of people. Uh, they, they don't necessarily agree with, but once you change their behaviors, then that's where you start kind of seeing the, the overall change in the atmosphere and the culture of a dispensary, if you will. Our focus has been very much on ease of use, and we've gotten a lot of organic growth that way. Um, and yes, you know, all of the all of the tactics that um, that Ken was talking about are great tactics to get consumer adoption. But merchant adoption is another question because when you're going through and you're talking with these with um, primarily gentlemen, um, dispensary owners, uh, to try to get them to adopt a new system, you need to talk about the benefits of your system. You need to make it easy for them to use as well. And it has to be something that they can understand. So going in and you know not, not talking over their head, explaining that to them that the cost of their cash is like somewhere in 20 to the 20, 20 to 22 percent of their revenue is actually going just towards cash management and security. Um, of that cash and being able to move it around, telling them about the, the benefits of the, of the platform and the integrations. Being able to play well with the other stacks of, of software that are out there is really critically important because this is 2019. We don't have to have systems that are dossy. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can have nice new systems that make it easier for them and you're gonna pay a little bit for the software but that's gonna save you a lot of money in terms of you know, conversion of the of the cash because you know honestly, like again, we're butt tenders turn over pretty quickly. It's kind of hard to know if you can. You, you've got cash sitting right there. You know, this is these are standard business problems. You have to sort of worry about that. Then there's the security of the cash actually going from um, from your dispensary to um, wherever you're depositing it or vaulting it. Um, and then there's the tracking part of it. Um, if you want to get banking in the future, you, you've got to have a tracking system for that capital, and it's all got to feed back into your point of sale, to your CRM, to, to the different um, data sources. And so having stacks that play well with others um, and are really easy for the consumer to use, like that ease of use is so important. Um, I mean, really making that a streamlined user interface um, gets a lot of organic adoption right there. We have, I was going to say, we have just a, a few more minutes left, and I want to pivot the conversation just a little bit with, um, I, I want to chat a little bit about the Safe Banking Act and A, what you, what your prediction is on A, is it going to pass? Um, and B, if it does, everyone seems to think that it's going to just revolutionize and, you know, the industry is going to change and everything's going to open up. Um, you know, it'll be like flipping a light switch. 
So I would love to get your, I would love to hear from you guys what you think that that is actually going to look like, both from a banking perspective as well as then potentially down the line the credit card processor perspe perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I don't. It's probably not going to pass Senate. Uh, yeah, it did pass the House. It's probably not going to pass Senate. It's too early, uh, especially with kind of the the election coming up next year. Um, but if it does pass, it was, I could be wrong. But if it does pass, basically what it's going to mean is that more people are going to have access to banking. Um, which is a great thing. I, it, we work well with the banks. We have you know four or five sponsor banks behind us now. That just gives our customers a place to put their money. Now, as it relates to let's call it payment cards, the Visa, Mastercard is still not going to get into the game, even though that even if it passes. So it's still going to be a federally Schedule One uh, drug listed. It's not going to declassify it. And so basically, from that pers it's it's giving the individual states and the smaller banks protection from federal government coming in and you know compromising their charters. So um, here we go, financial institution lawyer, going to do, do a little bit of a, a short lecture here. <laughs> um, and my apologies if you get bored, it's fine, go grab coffee. Because um, <laughs> knowing how the sausage works in the financial institution world is really boring it, to everybody but me. <laughs> so um, realistically, the Safe Banking Act does not do a whole lot. Um, it, quote, provides protection that's already basically been stated by the federal, the federal regulatory bodies that they're not coming after people's charters on this. I mean, it's been stated fairly clearly, um, and you just have to sort of know how to read between the lines with the, the federal regulators. But FinCEN uh, did a joint statement with the FDIC and the NCIC, so that's the Federal Deposit Insurance Commission um, for banks and the um, National Credit Union in, in, uh, Insurance Commission um, for the, the credit unions. And what they've said is basically, we're not coming after you for high risk as long as you're doing the reporting appropriately. Now, that's what we've built into our system to basically make that easy. So if they wanted to work with this space, it's a plug-in system that already does the reporting for them. It's done, because we know how to do this. We've been, we've been studying the space and understand you know, what's kept financial institutions out. And frankly, it has not got to do with the federal prohibition. That's actually a logical leap that people are taking because they're being encouraged to do so by the federally chartered institutions. Um, but what it really does is it just codifies what has already been stated by the regulators, is that they're not going after people's charters over this, as long as you're doing it appropriately and a, a balancing your, your risk management requirements and your obligations to the government um, for reporting that reporting those transactions. What's nice about it is it will encourage more credit unions and community banks to move into the space, but it's probably a couple of years away from passage if that if it makes it. Um, I do think that it's going to be um, sort of put on the back burner until the end of the election cycle because that's where everyone is focused right now. Um, and then, along with other scandal, um, but then even if it does pass, the protections that it provides are, are quite limited, and it's not going to do anything for federal institutions. And you're talking about Visa, MasterCard. These are listed companies, so they are federally regulated. Um, so they are, they are still going to take a very conservative approach to this to try to avoid any reputational damage that they think might ca may come of it just from a lack of data on the, on the space as it, as it moves towards a more um, regulated space. Um, final comment on that almost done, <laughs> um, is that the credit unions and community banks have limited resources that they can actually use towards, allocate towards the space. So the maximum deposit that any of them could really take in is about 10%. And really for safety and soundness purposes, they should really be somewhere between a two, for, two to four percent on deposits. That's just not enough. Uh, when you start talking about these institutions, a lot of them are less than a billion dollars in assets. And that's basically, OK, if you're being aggressive, you can allocate 100 million. And for dispensaries, I mean, they're pulling in 10, 12 million in revenue a year, even small ones. Um, I mean, it's, it's in, in recurring annual revenue. That's, OK, 8 to 10 accounts. That does nothing, absolutely nothing. And you can't get them to move into this space fast enough. So after passage, it'll be another two years before they can even implement a program that could work with this space. I mean, I guess unless they're licensing systems like ours. Um, and the resources for their compliance teams are already tapped out with what they're working on. So sorry for the long explanation, but really, this is still going to be classified as a high-risk space. And I don't think 
that this actually does very much for that because it's just even with state legalization, you know, the the federally inst the federally chartered institutions are just being very very conservative about their risk management on this. So, sorry, long long nope. way to answer. That was great. Um, we have a few minutes left, so I wanted to open it up to see if anybody had any questions. Yes, and stand up and speak loud, or I'll come down with the microphone. I was wondering about any conversational tactics like chatbots. Do you have any experience in any group? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in regards to chatbots, I most dispensaries haven't um, kind of onboarded that type of technology. I know that the in regards to sales, I know like Harborside, they have when they, for the last, I don't know, 10 years, they had like a support team that was on there full time, just answering different you know, different questions. And that was available on the menu. So I guess not as not chat bots, but they had a full like chat support team um, to process sales. So I think that's as far as what's been implemented now, I think people, uh, a lot of the dispensaries haven't, haven't brought that on yet. Um, I know there's a few companies that are trying to, to implement this for for retail. It's just uh, I think that the the one part that needs to be uh, worked on is the the database actually building out the the queries and you know all the different if and statements and data points to and connecting those to your menu. So I'm not sh I, th I don't think we're there yet, but I know that's going to be a huge factor. I know it's. Uh, in regards to sales, they're not there. I know a lot of dispensaries use it for like Facebook and different social media. Uh, Google My Business has a, a chat as well, um, but that's all managed through a user. And you can set things up. F Facebook's a chat box is pretty, uh, pretty advanced. Um, so you can, you can definitely leverage their chat bot you know, with different third party applications. So yeah. Even oh, cool. Thanks. Even with the BSA requirements being fulfilled through blockchain of tracking all of the transactions mm -hmm. through, um, it seems that federal, uh, not federal regulators, but like the mainstream banks seem to be still reticent about it. And if the federal regulators have been clear that fulfilling the BSA requirements means they wouldn't come after your charter, why do the mainstream banks still seem to feel that their charter's at risk? Is it really just a public relations kind of optics thing? So here is the. Um Here's the dirty little secret. The cost of complying in order to get this done um, is very, very expensive. And financial institutions at this point in time actually still do the majority of their compliance and actually everything with respect to processing <laughs> manually, by hand. So they have, they have very expensive compliance people, myself, y'all, you know, um, that that are extremely well versed in these areas of compliance that are honestly, they are so overworked and under resourced, and the systems that they use are just crummy. They're, have y'all heard of COBOL? Yeah, yeah. COBOL is something that they instituted in the 70s, and financial institutions have still not updated from COBOL. And it's part of, part of it has to do with implementation of these systems. Um, across the network, but a lot of this, I mean, it, you take a look at Wells Fargo's reputational damage from what happened with their salespeople. Their compliance team had no idea because the data is not getting to them because the systems are siloed and that data transfer is being done manually. So that's why we built it into our system. So this automates it, makes it very easy. Um, there's AI built in in order to make the investigation smoother so you actually know we've normalized the data based on purchase patterns. Um, in order to actually know when some mischief's going on. And what's beautiful about blockchain is you cannot hide what has happened. So somebody tries to sneak some transactions in, you're gonna catch them, like immediately. There's none of this, there's none of this trapped siloed data that doesn't get to the people who are supposed to be actually tracking it. And there's, that's where the reputational problem comes in. It's a resource problem, it's a cost problem. And it's, it's one where software actually does help with this. And blockchain is a beautifully buildable system that allows you to really kind of leapfrog these 1970s systems, these really dossy interfaces. Like I'm referring to that again. I'm dating myself. <laughs> but these dossy interfaces that are really difficult to use, take a lot of time, manual data transfer, not enough resources on your compliance team, expensive to bring in more people, and not wanting to spend 
on what will actually be an incredibly cost reduction and efficient system that would update their systems just because they don't know how to implement it because that's just not been their focus. Their focus has been on this, FinTech to them is the sleek interface, the, the customer interface, and that's wrong. FinTech covers a much broader span there and what they need to be fixing are their internal systems, not the user interface, because the user interface um, is, is much easier to fix. It's a lot easier to fix. So I hope that answered your question. So yes, reputation, yes, cost of compliance, and that, that's kind of where that's coming from. Yes. Hi, I'm, um, I'm working on a multi-state delivery platform right now, so payments is a big part of our biggest nightmare. As, as you'd guessed. I'm just curious what you think about the SAFE Act because I just read that Mitch McConnell's in California you're literally right now talking to CEOs and it's looking like it's probably gonna get passed but nobody knows what that means or how it's even gonna impact or when it would even become available, right? Again, for payments, it's not gonna do a whole lot. Um, the SAFE Banking Act really is a protection um, for uh, <coughs> depository institutions. Um, that means credit unions and community banks, and it's really only a protection for the ones within the state. Mm. So you have to geofence. This is what's really tricky about this stuff. Uh, for your for your your payments, you have to geofence within the state. You can't move that money across state lines. Other you tr otherwise, you trigger interstate commerce clause, which could get the federal prohibition slapped on you. Um, that's a real problem. And uh, yeah, you want mobile payments. You're talking about delivery. I mean, you want systems like like the two that are up here that are easy to use, easy for your consumer to get, available in the app store, and, and play well with your delivery system, so integrate easily. Yeah, another thing is, since you're looking at multi-states, the one thing I would consider as you're looking at payment processors, like make sure they're also adhering to federal regulation, but yeah. make sure they're also adhering to each individual state regulation. Yes. So each they individual has state. Money transmitter laws, yeah. Yep, each state has money transmission laws that you have to abide by. So if you're operating in a state and you don't have money transmission licensing, uh, so again, you, you're putting your merchants at risk um, yeah. for in many different ways. So not just federal, but each individual state has their own regulations as it relates to money transmission. Yeah, payments are actually primarily regulated at the state level. Um, they have obligations and requirements for reporting, but other than that, it's really state by state basis. Okay, I think we are actually at time. So if there's any other questions, we will be available um, outside the room, but the next session starts in 10 minutes. So quick thank plug, you. we oh. have a booth. Feel free to come back. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a puppy <laughs> thank you all. there, so you can have puppy time.